Let's get started. Okay, so here we're just going to look at a few currency pairs and the nicknames for the fully mean. Although there, there's much more than this, but then for the sake of now and this course, so these are the main ones we're going to be. These are the main pairs we're going to be cons considering in the course of the, um, the courses. So we have the Euro USD. That's the first one. Well, Euro against the US dollar, that's what it means. So the nickname here is Fiber or Euro. Then we have the GVP USD. GVP, Great Britain Pound, or the Pound Sterling, however we just say it, and then the US dollar. And the nickname is Cable. The nickname is the cable. And then we have um, the Euro GBP. Euro is just the Euro. And then the nickname is the channel. We have the USD catch. That's the US dollar against the Canadian dollar. Okay, sorry, a little uh, there. So we have the GBP JPY. GBP, the British pound against the Japanese. Uh, we we'll collect that before sending the PDFs. We have the Euro JPY. That's the Euro against the Japanese. You see, the nickname here is the EOP. The news NZD is the NZD stands for the New Zealand dollar against the US dollar. The nickname here is Kiwi. We have um, AED is AED is the Australian dollar against the US dollar. Nickname there is the Aussie, and we have Euro CHF, which is Euro against the Swiss franc, and the nickname there is the Swiss. Okay, so these are the these are the main pairs we're going to be focusing on going on in the course. So next thing we're looking at is forex trading hours. Forex trading hours. So these are basically the time in various countries where um, there's not more activity. For instance, now, assuming my time here at GMT plus one at around, say, 5 p.m., um, economic activities would have paused, let's say. So there will be no much um, economic event going on or trades as much as it will during the market hours. So different regions or, let's say, continents have their own timing, and that's what we're going to be looking at now. Okay, so we have four major sessions in trading. The first session we have is the Sydney session, which isn't very active. Let's say it's more or less just there, but it's not as active as the other session. So most times it's not really, not really considered. Okay. Then the next we have the Tokyo session. The Tokyo session. So uh, Tokyo, we use Tokyo here, yeah, but then normally or in other cases, people, people prefer to use the people prefer to use the um, the continent's names rather than using cities within the continent. Although the reason why we use the main the, the, um, the names of the cities here is because we are trying to refer to the cities with the most activity in the markets that's within that session. So although Tokyo consists of many other nations in Asia. But then they have the most active trading time. So we just use we just choose to call it the Tokyo session, although generally it's called the Asian session. And we have the London session. It's also the European session if you choose to. And we have the um, we have the, um, the North American session or the New York session. Okay, so the forex markets being open 24 hours a day doesn't necessarily mean that it's active all day. So what this means is that, well, we say the market is open 247, or let's say 245, 24 hours, five days a week. But then it doesn't mean that the market is that active and ready for a lot of traders 
every time of the week because depending on what you want to trade and how you choose to trade, there are times where you come to the market and you notice that there's no much movement in the market or there's very low volatility in the market, which is not very all the time, depending on your trading style. So based on your trading style, you'd have to know when is the best time to trade and when you have much more volatility in the market for you to trade. So um, we rest assured that you can still catch a move at any time of the day, depending on the session that's depending on the session that's active at the time. So, so what this means is that at any time of the day you are free, it's okay for you. You definitely find a pair that suits your trading time at that time, because twenty-four hours a day, it's one or two. There's one or two trading times that are there's one or two trading times that are free for you and that is active at any time of the day. So say you had to wake up one day in the morning. So there's a pair in the market time at that period that is active. Say it was 5 p.m., 3 p.m., 2 p.m., any time of the day, 24 hours a day, you can find a particular trade to trade. And then you should also note that the market closes around 12. So let's say 11 to 12 p.m. That's the closing time of the market every day. So it more or less um, kind of signifies a new day. So it just closes for an hour to usher in the new day. So the um, 12 p.m. That's the closing time for the market every day. So at that period, nobody really trades. But then it's not like the market closes per se. But then there is very low volatility in the market. So the movements are very small. But then you see spread increase. So if you see spread as much as um, one to two pips, which is very bad. So it's more or less trying to discourage trade from entry at that time. So entering trades around 11 to 12 on any day is not advisable. So, okay, so if you have any questions, if you have any questions, you can just ask your questions in the chats. And if the audio is not very clear, just let me know too in the chat so I will see how we need to subscribe. Okay, so moving on. So the market is open 24 hours a day. So this is the Sydney session. Sydney, Sydney session is between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. in the morning. That's James plus one. So each of these times you have to convert it to your local time to know when exactly the sessions are open. So the Sydney session is open between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. every day. And then the Tokyo session is open between 11 p.m. and 7, 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. every day also. Then the London session is open between 7 a.m. between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. every day. And then we have the New York or North American session it's open between 12, 12 p.m. and say 10 p.m. every day. So, like I said earlier, you could choose to use these sessions in um, as you could choose to represent them as continent or you could choose to represent them as the most active market times that's within this continent. So, for instance, in Tokyo now, we're seeing Asian, that's because Tokyo is the most active. In the Asian session, then we have the European day. London is most active in the European session. Then we have the New York time, the North American, sorry. And then the New York session is the most active in the whole of North America. So that's why we choose to use this to. So um, traders focus more on these trade sessions rather than watching the market on calls. And like I said earlier, the CD session is not very active, it's not as active as most of the other sessions. So a lot of traders prefer to just consider from the Tokyo session down towards to the New York session because you see much more activity around them. So, um, based on research and um, past experiences, the most active session in the day is between 7 a.m. GMT and 12 p.m. That's the London session. And remember, in the first course, we had that we said that um, the London session has 35% of the daily trader volume. So there's a lot of activity during the London session. Okay, so 
we have what we call session overlaps. That's where you see um, one session and the time, the time for one session coinciding with the time for the next session. For instance, when we have an overlap here between the London session and the New York session, we also have one here between the, um, the Tokyo or Asian session and the London session. So during these overlaps, there is very high activity in the market. So if you, if you, if you were to trade a pair combining um, the euro against the US dollar, for instance, within the session overlap here around the, uh, the overlap here between the London and the New York session, there will be very high activity in the market. So as you mean, say I want to trade uh, the um, Britain pound against the US dollar, trading it around these times between 12, 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. is going to be very, I'll see a lot of movements, which will be good for me or bad for me if my trades are not proper. So depending on the kind of pay you choose to trade for, or you choose to trade and your free time, let's say, you definitely find your time to trade. So you also see, um, you could also be much volatility around the um, around this um, session overlap here. So you could experience very high volatility around this period or this overlap here. But then most of the times, the whole of the London session session is always very active because of the amount of volume that students during this time. So we'll look into this for the um, sorry, let me clear this. Um, All right, so let's try and break down the sessions. So the most active countries within the session, we have China, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and Russia. Okay, so most, for instance, Russia, okay, most of these countries are quoted on uh, currency exchanges, but in Russia is not quoted. So this doesn't really mean the countries trade forex the way we trade, but then trade agreements between them and other countries, uh, yeah, other economic activities going on in the country is what moves the market. So these are these are most of the countries that are mostly involved. The other countries will be involved, but then their impact, let's say, not as much as we see in this country. So the active pairs during this time. So these are pairs that you could trade during this time and get enough for a good amount of volatility or market movement. So you have the USD JPY, USD, USD, Australian dollar against the JPY. New Zealand dollar against JPY, the Australian dollar is the Australian New Zealand dollar. So, so these are pairs that you could trade within these times to enjoy the activity because you don't trade in the market that is very silent. It's kind of boring and it's risky as well because in, if you say if volatility was to just spike, you could get yourself stopped out or something. So you want to trade setting pairs within certain hours to get most of the activity at the time. So considering how scattered the countries, sorry, considering how scattered countries actively trading are during these sessions, the end of the Asian session is often stretched beyond the Tokyo hour. So what this means is that because of the difference in time between these countries and the active countries, um, the Tokyo session is often extended a little bit beyond the time that we had in the previous slide. So if you check the previous slide, you see that Tokyo session ends around, say, well, I don't remember the time, but then there's a little extension. So it doesn't ex exactly stop at the time that was um, shown in the, in the previous slide. So you may have maybe one or two hours extra added to the, the activity in that instance. So the next session we're looking at is the North American session. So we have the active countries there in New York, Canada, and Mexico. And like I said earlier, the other countries are active during the sessions, but because of the amount of activity during the training time, we're not really considering them for now. So the active pairs, we have the pound against the US dollar, the US dollar against the Canadian dollar, the US dollar against the Japanese yen, the Australian dollar against the US dollar, the Canadian dollar against the Japanese. So these are pairs that you can still trade during this time. Then um, 
They're often called the New York session because of the amount of volatility in the market. And this volatility comes from New York, basically. So other cities may also contribute to the activity, but then New York is the most active city, let's say, at the time. So we just call it the New York session for the sick COVID. So the European session, so we have just London here because this is where most of the activity comes from. Although other countries like Germany, France may be involved, but then this is where most of the activity comes from. So um, we have, um, this session is also extended a little because of other countries like Germany and France who also get involved in trading during the sessions. Market volatility may remain steady up until 4 p.m. GMT. So, like we said earlier, because of other countries and the time differences, you could see a difference in the time in the time the end and also start as well, because they may start a little bit early and end much more further than expected. So a few key takeaways here. So forex, forex crosses are often very likely to experience much higher volatility during the European and Asian session overlap. What this means is that forex crosses, when we when we talk about um, forex, sorry, cross rates, we said cross rates are um, currency pairs that do not include the US dollar in their quotes. So pairs like the uh, US, sorry, pairs like the Britain pound against the euro or the Britain pound against the Japanese and the all forex crosses. So they they're, they're most, most likely to experience very much higher volatility during the European session and the Asian session overlaps. So if you're trading those pairs at those times, or if you look to make entries on those pairs, the best time to get high volatility in those pairs will be between, will be during the overlap between the European session and the Asian session. So when choosing a trading time, you must decide between Trading high volatile volatile times or trading at times with low volatility. Now, um, low volatility suits some traders. High volatility may suit some other traders. And what we mean by volatility is um, by volatility we just mean the rate at which the market moves. So when the market moves faster, you can say the volatility is higher. When the market moves lower, um, slower, sorry, you can say the volatility is is less. So the amount of movements. On each of or any, on any of these pairs at any time is what we refer to as volatility. So the next thing to decide is the best time to trade as as you can decide with your free time and your trading style. So now um, based on your trading style again, you could have a situation where your trading style does not fit into the time where you are free. Say you have to go to work or you have kids or one thing or the other. So based on your free time, you have to um, try to see which trading style coincides better with your the time as well. So those are things to consider. So next thing we're going to look into the things you must consider while choosing a broker. So these are a few things you must consider and the things we we've um, continually um, mentioned to our students or to people we trade with to consider because um, whether we like it or not, every every business looks to make profit. So our brokers are, our brokers, uh, they also try to make profit from us. Some brokers try to make much more profit than other brokers would. So we look for the brokers that will give us the best uh, value for our money and yet uh, still make profit, which is allowed. So let's move on. So, what must we consider while choosing a broker? Now, regulation and compliance. What this means is, what this means is um, every broker has to be regulated. And the regulations are like um, agencies that check and ensure that brokers are giving the right services. There's no fraud involved. There's no money, no money laundering involved. So oftentimes you may see situations where certain brokers are, are, are discontinued because of the poor services they offer. A number of brokers may be taking up um, hidden fees on trades that are not meant to be and a lot of things. So the first thing to check before selecting a broker is their 
public image and reputation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a good broker is one that would have a lot of clients. It would be more if if a broker is fraudulent, let's say you 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 would hardly be a lot of clients pursuing broker and all that. So a, a reputable broker will be licensed by and registered with the appropriate authorities. So there are a lot of authorities that are involved in this um, regulation and compliance. So there are, there are the regulatory bodies for um, forex exchanges, even our Bitcoin exchanges and other futures um, exchanges as well. So um, brokers in the US, for instance, will be registered with the National Futures Association, among other regulatory bodies. So, like the National Futures Association is a, is an agency that regulates mostly futures exchanges. That brokers that offer futures, that like indices and some other um, special pays like that. So, really, isn't forex exactly? But then, this is an this is an example of a of a um, of a regulatory body in the US, especially. So, details about Broker's regulation often showed on their website. So if you go through the broker's websites, there will be details on the regulation. If you don't find any, then the broker is not regulated. So there are a lot of brokers that are regulated. There are also what we call offshore brokers. But those brokers are not regulated. So they kind of kind of let's say offering the service without regulation. We won't always say there's there's scam brokers, but then they're risky to trade with. But then they offer some um, special um, features that normal brokers don't offer. So we we'll look into that later on also in the future. So another thing to consider is features and offers. So one thing to consider is leverage and margin. Now we've explained what all these terms mean. What all these terms mean. So depending on your style of trading, you might prefer a broker that will give you the opportunity to earn so much more money than you could. So leverage is one thing to consider. Leverage could be as high as one to three thousand on some brokers. But then remember that trading with leverage is very risky. So we had explained what leverage is. So if you were, if you were trading with leverage of one to three thousand and you actually uh, trade the full value of this, you stand a very high chance of all your capital and trading is actually very risky so you'd have to be careful with leverage choose although leverage could also benefit you if you are a very big trader so leverage isn't entirely bad but then it could be very risky so margin refers to the minimum amount balance for certain instruments that the broker allows so some brokers like we explained earlier too some brokers may have margin requirements of one, two, three percent, and so on. So depending on how you prefer to have to trade, you could decide to um, you could decide if the broker is perfect for you with all those magic requirements. So just check and ensure that this is a red flag for you because you know, depending on your trading style. So choosing a broker largely depends also on your trading style. So depending on how you trade, if I am a scalper, for instance, which is something we look on, we look, we look into later on. If I was someone that looks into wants to just place a trade and be out in less than a minute, I would want a very high leverage because of this, um, my trading stuff. But if I was someone who wants to take my time on the trade and actually wants to get it, we say over a period of three, four days, then there's no point having such high leverage. So it will not be something to consider for someone else while it's something for you to consider. So these are different, um, they're from different perspectives. So um, by looking at initial deposit also. So this is one thing to also consider because well, um, not everybody has the capacity and some, a lot of people may want to trade with a smaller amount of money. So this is very important to consider because you need a broker to match your capacity. When choosing the broker, this must be considered. A good initial deposit plus leverage to set you up perfectly for good profit. So, your brokers could, yeah, yeah, brokers who have a minimum deposit of hundred dollars. Your brokers who have a minimum deposit of ten. Some have fifteen. Some have a minimum deposit of even one dollar. But well, that's very, that's that may be good. That may be good. But then, depending on how much you are willing to deposit to at that time, 
is this is going to be something for you to consider because I think when you trade ten dollars, maybe you just practice trade or something like that. This is also this is something for you to consider. So somebody else trading with one thousand dollars may not see this as much of a big deal because I don't think any broker offers a minimum deposit less than um hundred dollars, except if it's maybe an ECN account or VIP account or all those special accounts. But then basically every broker should have at least the most I think I've seen is maybe hundred dollars. So hundred dollars. So somebody who has um thousand dollars to deposit, for instance, will not really bother himself with this aspect of of consideration. So you may have to look into other aspects and all that. So So the ease of deposits and withdrawals. So before finally selecting your broker, you are advised to check. You are advised to check the website to be sure of the various deposit methods available to you. So um, based on our region or um, regulations, so brokers may not be permitted to offer services to people in certain countries. So brokers may not be able to accept country money from you in certain deposit methods. Then. From the country where you come from, also there may be regulations that affect your means of deposit. So oftentimes, this might be affected by the country or the region in which you find yourself. So this would be a criteria to offer. So um, some countries, for instance, there are certain brokers, especially off. Okay, let's say offshore brokers. So generally, offshore brokers do not accept money or deposits in any other fiat currency. So their means of deposit withdrawals usually. Is via um, crypto. So, as you may say, your country does not, or let's say there's a bank based on crypto, it's impossible for you to get crypto in your country. So, you discover that this is a broker that you'd not be able to use because of such bans, or the brokers will have limits on the uh, transactions and all that. So, those are things to check. And most of all these things, I think you find on the broker's website. So, anything you look for on the broker's website that you did not see, then that should be a red flag for you because it shouldn't be high enough. So bonuses. So a lot of brokers offer you numerous bonuses coming in many different styles. Be careful when selecting a broker based on this criteria because oftentimes bonuses are traps. So all this means is that um, brokers often offer you kind of an incentive that would um, encourage you to trade with them. So you don't want to be Institution where you've accepted some of these bonuses and then you cannot then go because the um, demands on you are too high. So some brokers may give you ten dollars, for instance, for free to trade, but then not necessarily free because the broker would give you an outrageous amount of lot sizes to complete trading. And then trading on ten dollars is there's really not much you could do to. Um, to meet the targets of the broker. So you saw that the funds may be stuck, then you will not you won't be able to reach all these targets. So um this is a this this could be a trap in some cases, although in some cases it may be very um, useful because some brokers offer you what they call um, um a certain percentage on your deposits. So what this means is assuming you have a broker giving you 50% deposits, 50% um yeah, 50% deposits. Um, bonus. What that means is, assuming you are to trade or you are to deposit hundred dollars, you will have fifty percent of that hundred dollars added to your balance in credit. So that means you will be having one fifty dollars in your account. Now, um, the fifty percent goes to your account. This means that you have that much extra buying power in your account. So you don't even need so much leverage to be able to trade. So they give you much more buying power. And oftentimes you may not be able to withdraw that credit, but that credit is just being buying power. Although you may have to meet certain criteria also, or certain demand before you be able to withdraw that. But then sometimes it's good to have a boost in your account. So your broker could have could give you could give you a hundred percent deposit bonus. So um, can you guys see my screen, or is there any issue with the audio? Let's let me be sure before moving on. So just um. Send the message to the chat. Let me, let me make sure. Is 
Tá aí, sim. Okay, so if you have any issue with the audio or the video, just maybe disconnect and try and connect again. So the issue may be from here because here seems to have me okay. So just try and disconnect and connect again. Okay, so moving on. So another thing to consider is the instrument offered. So what it means is when choosing a broker, you must consider the instruments available to you as a trader. So not every broker offers the best package when it comes to this. So therefore, depending on your favorite trading style and instruments, this should be considered. So um, as a trader, you have certain pairs, certain pairs or certain commodities or um, CFDs that you prefer to trade. Some people trade um, gold purely. Some people prefer to trade indices purely. Some people prefer to trade forex. Some people prefer to trade minor pairs, some prefer to trade major pairs, some exotic. So everybody has their preferences. But then not every broker gives you everything combined. So some brokers could be, be limited or let say restricted to just offering you for X services. Some may be restricted to only indices, some may be restricted to only features, some some may be um, to just stocks and all of that or crypto. So you want to choose a broker that suits what you prefer to trade. So if you prefer to trade, um, say, Forex only, then there's going to be a broker for that. If you prefer to trade indices only, there's going to be a broker for that. If you prefer to trade a lot of instruments, as a vast variety of instruments, there's also, there's, there are also brokers that offer you that wide range of instruments. So you don't have to, because you want to trade um, Forex separately, you now get a broker different for Forex and then indices, you get a broker different for indices, and um, say, for the other metals, you get a broker different for other metals. So that's not um, very good because you want your funds to be in one place for your own safety too, because it's also part of risk management. So having such different funds may not be very good for you as a trader. Although maybe your trading strategy may support that, but then there are brokers that offer you most of all of this in one place. So you're looking for a broker which can give you all of this at the same time. So customer service. So customer service is very important for any company this is more or less the backbone, especially for a financial organization. So you don't want a situation where your money, you feel your money is stuck in a draw or you feel your money is stuck in deposit and there's nobody to answer to you. So Based on customer service, that's one of the major things to consider as well. So you most likely run into problems and you'll be happy to have someone at your service to respond to your complaints. So you always want a broker that is kind of ready to um, respond to any of your issues. So good customer service is very key. So in trading platform, so, um, this is an important criteria as well not very delicate because almost every broker offers forex and cfds offering forex and CFB, sorry have the necessary platforms although some brokers might have much more personal apps to help us in trading so what it means is that the basic platforms we use as traders as the meta trader four or five or whichever one you prefer to use those are the basic platforms that every broker has that so this is not really delicate criteria as, as that. But then there yeah, are certain people who are gotten used to trading on platforms like CTrader or the broker's personal websites or the apps. So you may have to consider all of that. So platforms like CTrader and the likes are not very platforms like CTrader and likes are not very popular. So now every broker has those ones. So you'd have to consider all that. But then every broker has the general ones, which is enough for traders. So now we're going to show you some of our recommended brokers based on our past trades with them and tell you reasons why we think these ones are the best options. So our top three brokers. So we're ranking them based on 
regulations, leverage the offer, commissions, initial deposits, instruments available, customer service, and their trading platforms. So the first one here is Vantage FX. Vantage FX is a very good broker. They offer you Forex, commodities, indices, a lot of, so they have a wide range of instruments. So the regulations, they're regulated by the Cayman Island Monetary Authority. So I think they're a broker in Australia. So they're a very good broker and they're regulated. They have leverage up to 500, that's going to 500. So maybe what we discussed on leverage. So this means you have in your account balance to be multiplied by 500, which is huge. But then again, very risky. So the commissions may be negligible. So there's nothing on, there's no specific calculation we have. But then trading with them, you notice sometimes you could see commissions depending on the pairs you're trading or the instruments you're trading. So the initial deposit, the minimum you can deposit is $50. So this could be a red flag for some people, but then, well, that's there. And instruments available, Forex, they offer Forex, commodities, indices, shares or stocks. So the customer service, rate them 4.5 out of five, which is not entirely bad. So the trading platforms, MT4 and MT5. So these are the general platforms everywhere. So the next broker we have is QT Forex. So this broker is not regulated. It's an offshore broker. So um, the leverage is one to 500. That's the max leverage you get. And commissions could be charged per lot. So what this means, charge per lot is, assuming there's an agreement to charge you um, $5 per lot on commissions. What this means is that um, any trade you open, as you may open a trade of one lot size, 1.0, one lot, that's one standard lot, you'll be charged $5 for that trade. As you may open, open a trade of say 0 0.01, which is I think like 1% of, or yeah, 1% of the standard lots, you should be charged 1% of five, which should be like 0 0.05 or so. So they yeah, charge per lot. So the initial deposit, the minimum you can deposit is $10, which is lower than advantage. So instruments are available, Forex, cryptos, and indices. Um, the customer service is quite good, 4.9 or 5, and they have only the MT4 platform. So um, the reason why commissions is not maybe high in some places is because they offer you some um, rare services or rare features. For instance, um, this broker we're talking of now has very good spreads compared to Vantage FX. Sometimes when you have very low spreads, that reduces that reduce, actually reduces broker's earning from spreads, but then it comes in form of commission. So low spreads is a very good thing for a broker for a trader. So and then not regulated, it's an offshore broker. So the means of deposits is via crypto. So you can't actually deposit with your cards or your bank accounts. So you can only deposit through crypto. So that's another thing to consider. But then they're very good for indices. They have very low, the lowest lot size for indices 0 0.01. So that's the reason why we recommend them. Because if you are, if you are an indices trader, you want, you want to reduce your risk by having the lowest possible lot size to trade. So that's why we have we, we choose them to trade indices. So basically just prefer them for indices, but then for Forex and other pairs, we prefer using other brokers because you don't want to be um, charged for every trade like that. But then it's also good to have all your capital in one place. So, so the next broker here, we have the Super Forex. So this is, an, this is a regulated broker and it's regulated by the International Financial Service Commission. Now they have leverage up to one to two thousand. And this is very high. You risk losing all your capital if you if you were to use the max leverage and exhaust your buying power. So this is one thing to consider. You have no commissions and the initial deposit minimum is one dollar. So instruments available for X cryptos indices. I think they also have stocks and all. 
So your customer service, you give them four over five. That's not bad entirely, but it's good. So we have a trading platform, the MT4, MT5, mobile app. So by mobile app, we mean we have the own personal app, which they, let's say they, they built to help facilitate the trading also. So some traders may be used to that. So some traders may not be used to MT4, MT5. So they prefer a broker that has something unique. So it's also good. So they're good for, so the, 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 the deposit methods are numerous. We have numerous, uh, we have numerous available options, including crypto, bank transfers, venue in country. So check out, the, check out the website and we'll be having our links to, so to, easier, to easily get access to all the papers. In our next, um, in our next mail we sent to you guys, we have, links to so it can help you through the application process and all that so so now we're going to look at candlesticks so candlesticks are we also you could also call them OHLC but so this is an example of the candlestick on the left hand side here so what OHLC means is open high low and close so oh, this is this is kind of a breakdown of the candlestick. So at uh, this point here, sorry. So at this point here, what this says is this is the high of the candle. So now the candle is representation of how the market plays in a day or in a week or in a month or how whatever time frame is you want to look at it from. So if we're saying, we could say this candle, for instance, is a one week candle. So what this means is that this whole structure was formed in a week. You could say it's a one day candle, or you could say it's a one hour, even a one minute candle, or a 30 second candle if possible. So what this just means is that this is how, this is the representation of how the market played out within that time frame. So this is, all right, let me clear this. Okay. All right, so here I have the high. Here I have the high. So this is the highest point the candle got to. Okay, let's start from the open. So this is where the candle opens. So what this means is that the moment a day starts or an hour starts or Let's, let's let's take let's use an hour for for reference. So let's say this is an hour one a one hour candle. So the moment an hour starts, this is where it starts from. So the moment um, assuming it was four o'clock, four p.m. So the moment four p.m. starts, it gets that line as the market starts. So during the fluctuations, you can see the markets moving higher, higher, higher and higher. So what this means is that the market opens around here, which is the open of the candle. And then the market closes around here. So it means within that one hour, after every movement, the market started from here. The market was able to get somewhere here. And then eventually at the end of the hour, that's by 4.59 at the last second. This is where, this is the last position the market was at. So what these weeks mean here is that at some point in time of within this one hour, the market got to this price, which is called the low. So this is the lowest point of the candle. And then at some point in time also, within this one hour, the market got to this point, which is also the highest point. So that's why we call them the OHLC bars, that's open, high, low, and close. So they show you where the market started, where the market started, where the markets ended. The highest point the, um, the price was able to reach within the hour, and then the lowest point the price was able to reach within the hour. So this is how to reach your candlesticks. So we also have, okay. Okay, so this is also called a bullish bar. So a bullish market or a bullish candle or a bullish bar refers to a market where the price is moving upward. So all this means is that you notice that the price started lower and then it ended at a much higher point. So like it started here and then it went up and it ended somewhere here. So that's why we call it a bullish bar. A different, a different, a different case. If you start here 
and end up here. When you think it, it start it starts somewhere here too and end up here. So the bullish buy is the market, the market is bar that is moving upwards generally. The reason why I say generally so because it may not only um, play in candlestick, it may play generally as on general market structure. So we'll look at we'll look at that later on too. So now we have the um, um, you could use any colors to represent your bars. So this is a bearish bar. So with the same explanation I had given earlier on the video, where I see the same thing, just that the bearish bar started higher and closed lower than it started. So it is a downward moving market or a downward moving bar. So this means that the market got to this point within this R and it also got to this point in this R. So within the fluctuations, it may have started somewhere around here. May have gone down this way, gone down this way. May have seen something like this, and maybe got somewhere here, went down, went down, got somewhere here as well. Was able to recover and then it finally closed at this point where it's closed. So all of this could have was is what could have happened within this one hour. So it's a bearish bar because it started higher and then finally closed lower than it started. If you had started here or somewhere down here and finally closed higher. Then would have said it is not it is definitely going to be a bullish bar. So let's move on. So the bullish market refers to market with price moving upwards generally. Bearish markets, same thing. So we have said this. So market orders. So we have um buying and selling. So what we mean by market orders are different. Different um, ways you could take your positions in the market. You could decide to buy, you could decide to sell. That's whichever way. So the basic idea of trading is to buy low and sell high. Or how? What's okay? Sorry. The basic idea of trading is to buy low and sell high. So what we are just saying here, although we'll look at it later on, is assuming you have a market that is moving this way. So for you to be the Whatever it is you are looking for, you're looking for a situation where you can buy somewhere around here and sell somewhere higher around here. Because when you sell, you actually expect price to move lower. When you buy, you expect price to move higher. So as long as things go your way, you'll be in profits. So you'll be in profit. So you're looking to buy somewhere here, you're looking to sell somewhere here. So that's the general idea of trading. So when you sell a currency pay, you're actually buying currency and selling the base currency. Now, this is the reason why you can sell what you don't actually have. So, the reason why you can actually sell what you don't have is because in the currency pair, okay, we have said this, this is the base currency. That's the first currency in the quotes, and then the quotes currency is the second currency in the quotes. So, what this means is that the base currency is the currency you are focusing on, while the quotes currency is the currency you're looking at it against. So, for instance, you have, say, this GBP is equal to 1.3345 or something like that. What this means is that one pound is equal to 1.3 something, something US dollar. So that's what it means. So when you sell a currency, for instance, as you mean you sell GBP USD, what you're actually doing is that you're buying USD against the rating pound. So it doesn't look that way because this is the way it's arranged. But then buying, selling you. USD would also look like you are buying USD or USD. Sorry, it looks like you're buying USD GBP, and there's no quote like that in the forex market. So that's why it looks. So that's why you're buying as in. So as you mean. So as you mean, for instance, now your GBP USD market is going like this. It means your USD GBP too will be coming the exact same way downwards. So there's no point to have them going the um, opposite ways. So when you sell, you're actually selling buying. USD against the GBP. So you're not like it's not actually like you're, you're selling. So it's more or less you buying USD GBP instead of selling or instead of buying GBP US. So um if it's not clear, we'll answer some questions with them. So let's let's move on. So when you buy a pair, this means you expect the base currency to be stronger than the put currency. So this is um I believe it's so explanatory. So if I was to buy this pair, GBP USD, so what I expect is that 
the pound is going to gain against the dollar. So the pound is going to be stronger than the dollar. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for situations where we can determine how price is going to play. So will the pound be stronger than the dollar or will the pound be weaker than the dollar? So that's basically what we're looking at. So assuming we have GBP USD is equal to 1.33445. This is how the quotes appear on your trading platform. So next week we'll look our uh, next year yeah, from our next session we'll look into we'll, we'll go into um, the application of the trading platforms so we can get more familiar with them. So what this means basically is we have this means one written pound is equal to 1.33445 US dollar. So that's basically what whatever you see there, this is what this is this is what it is. So when you see um when you look at your quotes, you would see. Normally, you'd see two prices. You would see the um, you see the ask price and the bid price. So the first price is usually the first price is usually the, um, the bid price, and the ask price is usually the, so the um, sorry the second price you see in the quotes is usually the um, the bid price. So your bid price may is usually is is always smaller than your your um, Ask price, so we could say the bid price could be one point three three four 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 one. So this is this. This means the spread here is going to be like about well, four points. So what this means is that this is the price that which you sell. This is the price that which you buy. So this means that when you buy, you expect you are expecting this to remain you know, better than you're you're buying at this price. Sorry, and when you sell, you are selling it at this price. So there's always a difference whenever you buy or sell. Now that difference is the spread, and that's the broker's um, say um, pay for that order that I took. So that's let's move on. So we have this. So this is the basic idea of trading. Now this is a um, a forex chart. This is a, this, this is just a portion of the chart now. So this point here is the current price so normally you would see two about two um sorry sorry so this is the current price here so normally you'd see about two lines so the two lines often time to signify the bid and the ask price definitely the sell the um, ask price is usually the one lower than the bid price so they move together so Except when there is a difference in spread, then you notice they may diverge a little bit, but then they often move together. So they they the ones they determine the price. So wherever they are is where the candlestick will be. So the basic idea of trading is to get um, a situation where you be able to take positions at sorry to be able to take positions somewhere here or somewhere here because. You want to be able to sell at a very high at at not it doesn't have to be this high. You could you could you could find yourself taking a sell somewhere here. You find yourself taking a sell somewhere here. Or you won't find yourself taking a sell somewhere here. But then you, all you want is that the market ends up at a lower price than you initially took it. So you could also take a sell somewhere here. So that's it. And then to be able to to buy when when buying to you also want to situation where price moves higher so you could take a buy here take a buy here you could take a buy here you could take a buy here you could also take a buy here but then you don't ever know what's going to happen in the future so you kind of want to reduce your risk by ensuring that you make perfect analysis because most times you may never be able to actually get you may never be able to actually get your entries at this kind of positions so it's very rare for you to see for you to be able to um, get such pinpoint entries. So that's the reason why you have to apply risk management, which is a, going to be a mood on its own. So you can't, you, you can't always get your um, entries this perfectly from all these points. But then getting entries at these points, such points like this is actually not bad. So this is, all right, so um, moving on. So long versus short, I think this is something we may have heard. So what do you mean by long or going long or something? 
So going long or taking a long position simply means buying the markets. So going long and buying, there's no difference between them. But then the terms you hear of it. So when you hear going long, what is it, what does it exactly mean? So when you go long, you expect the price, you expect the base currency to gain strength over the code coins, which is something you said about buying dollar. So this means we are buying the base currency and selling the code currency. That's what we've explained earlier. So yes, I don't think there's much to say here. So going short here, a short position simply means selling the markets. And when we do this, we expect price to drop for us to be able to buy back our position at a lower price than we sold it. So like I said um, earlier, okay, what's, when we sell, sorry, I have to go back. When we sell, what this means is that Assuming we take a sell from here, when price comes back here and we take out our trade from here, what this means is that we, we sold this here, but then we had to buy it back here. So whatever you sell, what you're selling, for instance, it's more like the broker giving you what you don't have. And then find, when you're ready to let it go, you would buy it back from the broker. You get, so you would make this much profits from that particular trade. So that's what happens when you sell. So when you sell, you have to buy much lower. And then when you buy, you have to sell what you buy much higher. So it's more or less a, a general um, a general thing. Because even in business or in sales, you expect that sales go higher, then you'll be able to sell at a much higher price. So that's what we Okay, so I think we're through this slide. So this means we're buying the post currency and selling the base currency. That's what we're doing when we go short or when we sell. So selling and long and short, buying and sell, they're all the same thing. So pending orders. So pending orders are typically orders that you expect to be filled when certain market conditions are fulfilled. So it's more or less like telling your broker that, okay, um, if price gets here, I want you to help me buy it or I want you to help me sell it. So you don't actually have to be there, but then they will be filled when those uh, conditions are met. So you don't actually have to be there all the time. If you expect price to be, to, to reach you at a certain point and you expect a certain reaction from the market, maybe based on your analysis, like this depending on that. So that when you are not available, you could have the other field on your behalf. So this is a trader. This, this is a trader informing the broker not to take a position at the current price, but to take a position at a later price if certain conditions are met. So this is you saying, telling the broker that, okay, um, I don't want this position to be filled right now. But then in the next hour, in the next two hours, if price gets to this position, then I want you to help me sell it. I want you to help me take a long position or whatever it is. But so that is what penny orders are. So we have two types of penny orders. We have the limit entry order. So the limit entry order, all these is, is, is are used when you want to buy lower than the current market price, or you want to sell above the current market price. So you can have limit orders in both directions. So let's use this chart to kind of explain. So as you mean, this is your current price right now. So you have your current price here. So this is this this is your current price right now. So if you want a, this is your current price right now. So if you want a limit order, what is what what we're saying is this. Assuming you want a sell limit, what is what a sell limit means is if price was to get to this point, you want the broker to help you sell it. Maybe you, based on your analysis, you've anticipated or you've expected that the moment price gets somewhere here, it's going to fall back down. So you know you will not be available, you know you're you be connected at the time. So you could just set a limit order to go down. So you notice that your limit order, your, your limits for itself is much higher than the current price. So that's a limit order. So let's assume, for instance, okay, let's say, let's say at this point, let's assume nothing had happened yet. So let's say, um, let's say here was still blank. Let's say nothing had actually happened here yet. So I'm saying after a, some analysis and all that, I. I, I I have analyzed and then I expect that okay, when price gets to this region, let's say I've expected that when price gets to uh, when price gets to this region, I want a buy. But then at the time where you as at the time where you took where you um, 
where you were looking at the market structure, let's say it was only this that was fulfilled. So you want a situation where price comes down here and you take it by automatically. Now you will not be here in the next five hours when it happens. So you want to be able to set a you want to be able to set a buy limit somewhere there. So that when price is when price is filled, when price gets to that region, then the order will be filled automatically for you. So you don't really have to be there. So you possibly just be online and then you discover that okay, the order was filled for you. That's okay. So this is all on limit entry orders. So next we have is sorry. Next we have is stop entry orders. So the stop entry orders is the opposite of limit orders. The limit orders you take for the stop entry orders, you want to buy, you use it when you want to buy higher than the current market price or sell lower than the current market price. So you can also have this in both directions. So what this means is that assuming this is your current price. So if you want the market to buy at this position, so what this means is that the moment market gets here, the moment market gets here, it keeps going up. So if you expect the market to just keep going up like this, but then you don't want to take the position immediately, then you could use a buy limit. So this is an order to buy. So like the sell stop. In order to sell, in order to sell, the buy stop as in the previous, the buy limits, the buy limits are in the previous, right? The circle here, so I'll correct this before doing this. Uh, so I meant the buy limit here. So in the buy limits, in the buy stop, sorry, in the buy stop, this means that the moment market comes to this region, it keeps going. So for the um, for the sell stop also. It means when price gets here, it keeps going. So you don't really expect price to come down and keep going back up. So we're looking for a situation where price keeps going. So that's the reason why you use the buy stop or a sell stop. So these are this 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 here is meant to be buy limits. So let me just kind of quickly. So this is meant to be this is meant to be a buy stop. And then it's meant to be a sell stop down there. So I'll correct that for using the course. So this is this is all on the stop entry orders. Okay. So let's see what we have next. Okay, so um that's this is the last this is this is where we're going to have to stop the play. It's already past an hour. So if you have any questions, I would want to I'll be ready to answer your questions in chat. So you just let me know what you have to ask. So while we do that, so our next session we'll be looking at the forex trading styles. So before this, I would have sent some, I would have sent some, I would have sent some materials that you need to possibly download or register so that you will be able to um go through the, the platforms before our next session. So if you have any questions, maybe within the next five minutes, if you have any questions, we will be able to answer them. So. Okay. All right. So we have say four minutes to answer the questions now. Um, well, we wait. Um, we have a we've had a mobile app for our community. So it's not on iOS yet. But then it's for it's on Android, so you could download the app. So if you just go to your um, Play Store and 
search for one group major fix with our community. So you get to meet a lot of traders and share ideas with the Forex community. So good. Well, just grow your knowledge that way. So I'd also encourage you to lead to that in emails going up with us. Well. If you guys follow, you just drop a message in the general chats. Let's let's be sure we all understood 